Good afternoon and welcome to this free Nursing Times webinar on infection prevention and control. Firstly, it's great to be here and thank you for joining us. Today's event represents the latest in our 2023 series of webinars on clinical skills with the aim of supporting nursing staff to have sufficient clinical skills to operate confidently, efficiently and safely. Uh, so previously, we've covered topics including urinary catheterization and tissue viability. Today, however, we are going to be talking about the basics of infection prevention and control, standard infection control precautions, and transmission-based precautions. I'm delighted to say that our speaker this afternoon is Lucy Brown, who is Director of Nursing and Midwifery Leadership Development at the Florence Nightingale Foundation. So obviously infection prevention and control is crit a critical component of healthcare delivery and nurses play a crucial role in preventing and controlling the spread of infections within health and care settings. This, uh, this session is designed to provide nurses with the knowledge and skills necessary to, eff uh, to effectively sorry, implement IPC measures and protect themselves and their patients from infection. So the topics that we're going to cover include hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene um, slash cough etiquette, sharp safety, safe injection practices, sterilization and disinfection of patient care items and devices, and personal protective equipment or PPE. So by the end of the session, we hope that participants will have a deeper understanding of the importance of IPC in health and care, as well as practical strategies for implementing IPC measures in various health and care settings. Uh, just to remind you that after the presentation from Lucy, we have some time for questions. So please post those in the Zoom chat box that you should be able to see, um, and I will put those to Lucy on your behalf. So that's, uh, that's pretty much it from me for now. I'll now hand over to Lucy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to present on uh, the fundamentals of infection prevention and control. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, just give me one moment and I'll start the presentation. Now, it will be a whistle-stop tour because, as you can imagine, I could probably spend a week training you up on all the areas of uh, standard precautions for infection prevention and control. Um, but a little bit about me. Why do I think I'm qualified to tell you about this? Well, I'm an ICU nurse by background, a very proud paediatric intensive care nurse uh, for a number of years, worked within the community as well, um, but also been in director of nursing posts, which held the also the um, responsibility of infection prevention control. So a dipsy, so not a Teletubby, but a director of infection prevention and control, which obviously came with lots of responsibilities and as such studied a postgrad in IPC. So something I've been really, really passionate about throughout my career and hopefully I can make it exciting for you and ensure that you can get your teams excited about it because it is all of our responsibility to keep our patients safe. So just thought I'd start off with a Florence quote, given that I um, work for the Florence Nightingale Foundation. And I love this one. It's about, let us never consider ourselves finished nurses. We must be learning all of our lives. So you actually will demonstrate that, that you've actually tuned in today because you clearly want to learn more about the safe practices. And I guess my ask is, take all this information back to your teams, share this best practice so that we can really encourage safe and better practice for all of our patients and populations, but actually keeping ourselves safe as well. So as Steve rightly said, we're going to be covering a number of topics and actually new guidance was published back in April 2023, um, which I'll refer to throughout the presentation today on new standard infection, well not new, just <laughs> pulling together the standard infection um, control precautions that we need to take um, heed of when we're practicing. But actually it's aligned to the UN, um, the United Nations um, sustainable goals as well, which I think is really important to think about the global impact that we have. And if you look clearly at those in, in here, it talks about clean water and sanitation and good health and well-being. So that's really aligned to our practices as nurses, midwives and across the uh, clinical team as well. And as Steve Riley said, we're going to be covering a, a few topics, a whistle stop tour because we can't go in depth, but we'll be signposting to lots of really helpful references and the standard framework as well. And some wonderful things from NHS England, NHS Scotland and the RCN as well. So lots of really good resources. So the idea is this is a resource for you to take back to your teams to really improve practice. 
and teach one another and educate one another. So I won't go through those again. So why is IPC so, IPC so important? Well, I'm sure you probably know, but I think it's good to, good to recap. As Steve said, it's an absolutely critical component of healthcare and it's a crucial role. We play a crucial role in controlling, preventing the spread of infections through a number of ways, which we'll talk through in a, in a, in a moment. But interestingly, globally, there are some, um, uh, some reference from the World Health Organization There's a link there if you're interested in reading about the prevalence of infection prevention across the globe. Out of 100 patients in acute care hospitals, seven patients in high income countries and 15 in low and middle income countries will acquire at least at least one healthcare associated infection during their hospital stay. So we need to really make sure we get on top of this. Interesting, more locally within the NHS in England, there was a study Eight um, estimated 834,000 healthcare acquired infections in 2016-2017, which cost the NHS 2.7 billion. Now that money could be used elsewhere to support services and really ensure that we're supporting health inequalities across our health system. Something that's really important, isn't it? But actually, more importantly, 28,500 28, individuals died as a result of healthcare inquired infections. So it's really, really important we get on top of this. Um, that amounts to 7.1 million occupied hospital bed days, um, which is quite an astonishing amount, isn't it? But also the fact that us ourselves as healthcare professionals will have to take time off work because we're unwell, because we're exposed to these pathogens and infections as well. And actually that's a loss of 79 thousand almost 80,000 days that we could be at work supporting our patients and the families and our populations around us so I hope that's enough to, to help you to buy in to why IP is so so important so what's the best way to tackle this well this probably won't surprise you actually looking at education and training in the fundamentals of IPC so that's why we're here today how can we ensure that we do the basic things to make sure we keep ourselves and our patients safe and the prevalence is probably will, will become a no surprise to you and something I'm really passionate about. So we'll be peppering this through my talk today around sustainable healthcare and looking at how we treat diseases. But actually, there's been a huge increase in vector borne infections and also the concerns around antimicrobial resistance as well because of the environmental impacts across our globe. So it's something we really, really need to heed and ensure we put in place. And also, just to, just to, um, Add in there is the 10 standard infection control precautions, which are going to whiz through today. Um, and the manual's there for you to read, digest and really learn all about. But I've pulled it together, hopefully in a helpful pack for you to share with your teams and, and make it a bit fun. So let's start off by talking about the transmission chain of infection. So this might be revision for some of you or maybe new for you to think about. But actually, if we can break any chain, link in this chain, we can stop the spread of infection which is a, hopefully a good thing to do, what well, is a good thing to do. So the first area is the infectious agent, that pathogen, that bacteria, that fungi, the virus that has caused that infection. Um, and what we need to do is really improve our knowledge around how they work and understand, but that is the infectious agent. So we need to stop that getting into the system. The next chain um, in, the, um, in the transmission chain, or link in the chain, should I say, is the reservoir. So that's where this pathogen is um, grow, thrive, develop, multiply, reproduce. Um, and they usually like it to be a wet and warm environment as a general rule. But that can be in food, it could be in our gut, could be in our water, could be in our soil, um, but could be naturally occurring within the soils as well. But it's just it's out of its natural environment. So it's just thinking about how we could break that reservoir and make sure that they haven't, um, they can't grow and multiply even further. The next is the portal. So portal of exit is portal of entry as well, is how can we stop that? So this probably seems that one of the most effective ways to stop the transmission of infection is through washing our hands. More about that in a moment. But it's really critical that we wash and we um, ensure that we wash our hands and continue to ensure good hand hygiene throughout all of our practices. Um, and also making sure the safe handling of bodily fluids as well and cleaning our environments. But we'll talk about that again in a moment. Um, the mode of transmission. So this is quite interesting. We need to break the mode of transmission. We can do that in a number of ways. There's direct contact and indirect contact. So indirect contact, maybe so it's something called fo uh, fomites, which is um, 
articles, objects that will transmit um, infections. That might be a pen, for instance, a doorknob, high touch areas like light switches. So it's just something to be really aware of. Also stethoscopes around necks and perhaps ties, which I know back in the day, they shouldn't be worn now uh, for our doctors, but it's something to really think about and acknowledge and make sure that we're wiping and cleaning those areas regularly and frequently. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, the next is the portal of entry. So how has it got into our, our system through our bodies? So it might be through an open cut, through tubes, through catheters, through all sorts of areas as well. But, so it's just thinking about how we can clean and ensure that those areas of entry um, are not entered by infections or infectious agent. And last but not least, we obviously need a susceptible host. So we need to think about our patients, think about our um uh, immunocompromised patients as well who have a lower immunity who may be more at risk think about those with chronic diseases um, diabetes for instance who've got invasive devices i've spoken about may have long lines due to dialysis all of those areas we need to be really really mindful of and it's really important we ensure that all our patients are hydrated and have good nutrition as well to support um, and breaking that chain of infection as well and it's really important we perform a risk, assess a risk assessment on every single patient that comes into our care or, or, um, or resident as well, depending on where the care setting is. So I'm going to talk about that next, about patient placement and assessment of infection risk. So this is a whistle stop. So patients, every single patient, every single um, uh, client or resident, is where, depending on the area of work that you work within, should have a risk assessment. Make every patient, every care setting, every time should be assessed for risk. So that's looking at um, where you place the, the patients, the decisions you made, what their clinical needs are, as we've discussed just now, but also thinking about the cross infection risk as well. Um, could be diarrhea, they could be vomiting, they could have an unexplained rash, could have a fever, respiratory symptoms. It's really important that we test and monitor these patients that come into our system um, and where they've come from as well. Have they come from another care setting? Have they come from home? We really need to make sure that we note that down. And what's really, really important that often gets missed, and so I want to speak to some of my uh, IPC colleagues is that people don't escalate. You may well document it really beautifully in the notes, but you don't always escalate that the patients have had diarrhea or vomiting or any of those areas as well. So it's really, really important we communicate and escalate properly. Probably the most important thing for a risk assessment as well. You need to think about multi-drug resistant organisms as well, such as VRE or MRSA. Um, and thinking about if patients have been outside of the UK as well, that perhaps they've been um, retrieved from overseas um, and repatriated. So thinking about those areas as well. And also thinking about the transmission rates. So thinking about how the, the um, whether it's been contact, droplet or airborne. So just out of interest, contract can be attributed to skin to skin. Um, and that can be not so just from human to human, but might be from animals as well. And thinking about different ways that you may be skin to skin, so through sexual intercourse or through kissing as well. So it's thinking about all of those, those ways that um, infections are spread. The other areas through um, direct contact is perhaps through um, airborne. So think about coughing, sneezing, even singing. I don't know if you remember back in the pandemic, people weren't allowed to sing at school. So just thinking about that as well and talking. Airborne, as we come into winter, as we and sadly haven't got as much UV light in the air, we're seeing an increase in um, airborne viruses, which is normal every winter. We get our winter pressures, but it's just thinking about that as well, that viruses love um, less UV because obviously that sterilizes and kills them as well. And as I said earlier, it's important to think about vector spread. So that's these wonderful creatures, insects such as mozzies and ticks and fleas that are now spreading more disease as well. So thinking about that and the transmission rate. Um, on the right hand side of the slide is about the hierarchy of controls, which is a lot more in the links that I've put at the bottom. Is This is really just a whistle stop tour for you to think about. But if you just thinking about how you can eliminate the risk and there's a hierarchy that you can see. So if we can eliminate the hazard, you know, physically remove the hazard from the area, substitution, replace the hazard. So if there's any way you can replace it being there. Engineering controls, so perhaps if you isolate uh, patients, so thinking about how you'd isolate patients that are um, exhibiting signs of infection. Administration controls as well, change the way that people work. Perhaps obviously for us working with the healthcare settings, we have our occupational health reviews as well. And if you can't avoid um, access or exposure to the hazard or the infection, then it's about using PP, the right equipment for the right job to keep yourself safe and the right training and education as well. So that's just something interesting there and more links at the bottom because it is obviously a whistle stop tour today. 
So next up, and this might not be of any surprise to you all, is hand hygiene. It's so critical that we do this right, that we wash our hands properly or use hand rub as well. Both, um, both ways are just as effective. Uh, but if you have sword hands, it's really important that you wash them. So if you're in the clinical environment, sorry to say, <laughs> No nails. I think I've still still don't wear any. No false nails. No acrylics. It's a brilliant reservoir for bacteria, for pathogens to grow and reproduce. Um, so it's really important that you don't wear those at work. It probably seems quite obvious, but and that give your colleagues a gentle nudge if you notice them. You know, don't have to be strict and point, but actually nudging individuals to have good practices and safe practices is really really important. Make sure that you're bare below the elbow, as we know. You no know, watches and only a simple band that you're allowed to wear because it's really important. Again, jewels on rings are a really great reservoir for bacteria and pathogens to grow and um and multiply and reproduce as we spoke about earlier so this will probably be very common practice to all of you but just really important and share it within your teams as well um, this is from the world health organization and health protection scotland um, so wet your hands probably seems quite obvious apply the soap and rub palm to palm some of the most common areas that are missed is in between your hands your thumb so really make sure you give good them and the palms of your hands as well. I think you grab most things with that as well. So it's really important you don't miss those areas and timing as well. Making sure that you step, follow steps three to eight for at least 15 seconds, which might feel like an age when you're rushing around the ward and trying to do lots of things. But it's so important we do that right, because that is one of the best ways we can prevent the transmission of infection within our healthcare settings and system. Hand wrap is just as effective. In fact, there's been lots of research and studies so it can be even more effective. But obviously for sword hands, you must wash them with soap and water, warm water. Um, for hand rub, very similar technique, making sure that you get your nail beds because they're often, um, often missed, your thumbs as well, and the palms of your hand. And any IPC link nurses on the call today, it's really fun to get the UV light. I don't know if you've done that before, and the um, gel, which is a bit of a, a bit of a fun exercise through the teams to show the effectiveness as hand hygiene. So nice to do every now and again as a bit of a team building exercise. But really, really critical that we get this right. I move on from there. So next area is PPE, personal protective equipment, PPE. Now, I think through the pandemic, it's fair to say that we wore a lot of PPE and we gloved up for every, every intervention. And I just wanted to kind of draw your attention, and this is in the uh, manual as well uh, from NHS England, is around here about when you need to wear it for standard infection control precautions. So if you have a look here, there's no anticipated exposure to blood body fluid, mucous membranes or non-intact skin, then you can, you don't need to wear gloves and apron. And I think something that we've been a little, become a little bit frightened of is we put gloves on and aprons for every intervention now then because as we come out of the back of the pandemic. So just something to really consider and be more considered in your approach when you do put PPE on. Think about this and keep this table in your head. Obviously, if you're gonna have exposure to bodily fluids, you should wear an apron and a glove. Um, and obviously look at the risk of spraying and splashing as well. Um, but also thinking about um, others, you may need a gown or an FRSM, which obviously you need to be um, so fluid resistant surgical mask, mask, which you will need to be tested for as well, as we do for all fully remember. And obviously about splashback as well for your eyes and your face, because obviously you can absorb infections through your eyes as well. Hand hygiene must be performed before putting on and taking off PPE as well. So just remember, and also consider the environment that you're in. I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment, but consider the equipment and the items that are in the care area as well. And just on the right hand side, I'm not going to run through all of this because you can see, and I want this to be a resource for you to take back to your areas, but this is how to don and doth, so put on and take off, I don't want to say don and doth, but how you put on PP and take it off safely and effectively as well to ensure you minimise the risk of infection, further infection across there. And I think much of that will be very familiar to all of you following a pandemic, but just important, just as a bit of revision as well. So I did, I think it would be a miss of me being that I, I have a huge passion for sustainability in healthcare, not to talk about the Royal College of Nursing Gloves Off campaign. So if you haven't heard about that, familiarise yourself with the table that I just shared with you about when should you wear gloves. But just thinking about it, many occasions within our, our healthcare settings and system, we don't need to wear gloves because it's a back switch. If you're changing a bed, you don't necessarily need to. Um, if you're bathing a patient, all of those areas, you don't necessarily need to wear um, gloves. So it's just thinking about, more considered about whether you put them on. 
Um, just to give you some statistics, because I know I love a bit of evidence to back up what I'm saying, we used over 5.5 billion, that's billion, this is in the UK alone, in 2020 to 2021. It's a huge amount, isn't it? Think about that while ending up in landfill or being incinerated and going into our environment, on, into our beautiful planet. So it's really important that we educate ourselves on this and our teams as well. And I just wanted to share kind of on the right hand side, some fascinating statistics on kind of the impact of healthcare on the environment. And just interesting, the top left hand corner, the carbon footprint of global healthcare, it's, um, it's may, may or may not become a surprise to you, but the healthcare industry is the fourth most polluting sector on the planet. And I think we can all play our part in reducing the impact that we have by making sensible and considered approaches to the choices that we make within practice. So I thought I'd just mention that to you. If you look at the bottom left, um, bottom left hand side, it talks about deforestation. So a lot of trees are being native trees are being cut down for rubber plantations for surgical gloves. It just gives you a bit of an insight into what's happening in our, our world at the moment. And if you're interested in that, please do uh, um, visit the FNF's website. We've got lots of information on sustainability and something I personally am very passionate about and our teams. So I'll move on now. So respiratory and cough etiquette. I got this lovely poster, thanks to Harrogate and District NHS Foundation Trust. It's a lovely poster, which I think really um, demonstrates what we need to do. So it's important that we don't cough everywhere, all over everybody and all the surfaces as well, isn't it? We want to minimise the spread. I think when you've seen, if, if, if it was died, when you cough or sneeze, the spread is quite extraordinary. You can fill a whole room with the droplets that are expired through a, a sneezing episode, which isn't very pleasant. Um, so what we need to think about is how we cough and sneeze. So always use a, a clean disposable tissue, not your hands, if you can avoid it. And uh, make sure you dispose of that as quickly as you possibly can in a waste bin. In the next instance, cough into your elbow like this. <laughs> to try and avoid it being spread because so if your hands are high touch you touch a lot of the high points with that you'll be spreading it on those lovely doorknobs and the light switches I spoke about earlier so it's just about making it to minimize that effect as well and as soon as possible after your coughing incident um, or episode make sure you wash your hands or use hand scrub as I've said earlier or hand wipes if, if needed but really really important particularly now as we go into winter season um, where we see the heightened um uh, incidents of um, infections, respiratory infections that we really do take heed, but also encourage our patients to do the same as well, isn't it? Those that are in our care, um, pass them a tissue and make sure they're um, adhering to that advice as well. So it's really, really important. The other thing just to be mindful of is if you have got contaminated hands, you can spread obviously through your um, membranes, so through the mucous membranes in your nose and your mouth, also through your eyes as well. So just being mindful of that too. Probably seems fairly straightforward, but something we all need to practice. Nudge our colleagues, make sure we see those good practices. It's not about kind of being authoritative and, and telling people off, but actually giving people a gentle nudge and showing them the right way is a good way to get that behaviour change that we need to see for our patients too. So this is a very whistle stop. So I could probably spend a whole day talking about this, but mindful of um, the time we have together today. So this is about the safe management of care equipment and the care environment. So I've pulled those two um, standard um, infection precautions into one uh, slide, really. Lots of valuable resource on the right hand side around the healthcare cleanliness standards, which are in the national standards, which I'd really, really encourage you to digest and read, which gives a bit more information there. What's really important is a lot of healthcare professionals and I would, um, don't think that cleaning the environment is necessarily their role or their job, but actually it's just all of us to work together to clean the equipment, the environment that we work within, and should be something that we do routinely. So it's about wiping down beds, wiping down underneath beds, high touch areas, all being responsible together for cleaning the environment to make sure that it's, it's free as possible for any infections and pathogens. It's not just for the cleaners that come in once or twice a day to do, it's for all of us to adhere and make sure we do the right thing to keep our patients safe. So it's about ensuring that we easily contaminate equipment that has body, um, body fluids, blood, secretions, excretions, infections, agents on, to make sure we're not transmitting from one area to the next. Now, when I spoke to um, been some of my colleagues, I think one of their bugbears, and I thought I'd share this with you, was the commode. The commode is such a um, such a um, piece of equipment that isn't always wiped down properly. So I think next time, I think my ask of you is next time you're wheeling a commode in between patients, 
really make sure you wipe it down properly, lifting up the lid and wiping it down. I think from my experience and, and colleagues I've spoken to, I don't think I've ever done a hospital infection where I've not found a really lovely clean commode. So please, let's try and make that a thing of the past and make sure we clean that down, that transmission rates, you know, for the um, diarrhea and vomiting and all of those areas as well. We often forget about splashback and those wonderful things. So make sure you keep things nice and clean. The care, the care environment as well is wiping down the sides that you use. As I said, the bed space, damp dusting, we used to call it my day, but I know I'm a bit long in the tooth now. But it's just really making sure that the environment's clean, like you would perhaps your own home as well. Take pride and make sure that the environment's nice for our patients and the, the people that are within your healthcare settings as well. The other really important thing about equipment is making sure that they're in good repair. So if you see torn fabric or um, torn in chairs or on beds, it's really important they're replaced because that's a really good reservoir for breeding infections further. So they, they love those environments, warm and wet, where they can multiply and reproduce and thrive. And we want to stop that. So it's about making sure if any equipment is in, in disrepair, is replaced, removed pretty quickly um, and put in place. And then also to have a look at is making sure that we follow cost risk assessments as well for product use, for equipment and making sure we use the right cleaning equipment for those areas. So please, again, look at the national standards, make sure you familiarise yourself with what needs to be cleaned, how we de de decontaminate effectively um, and use those areas as well. It's really important you think about the, the type of equipment we're using, if it's single use or multi-use per patient, and really familiarising yourself with that. For instance, if you're using equipment, you notice it's been con um, contaminated or tampered with, it's best you don't use it just to, for risk of uh, can speak today, decontamination as well. So just be really mindful of that um, and keeping our patients safe. Um, if you have any concerns about that, this is important medical devices are wiped down. So ventilators, infusion pumps, all of those areas as well. We make sure we wipe those down um, to ensure that we don't spread disease, uh, spread infection as well. So I'm just going to share this lovely. So I'm trying to make it easy for you. So you've got all the information all in one place. So this is a really wonderful way to decontaminate reusable, non-invasive care equipment, those lovely commodes I was talking about earlier. Just making sure you follow these standards to make sure things are clean properly. If you don't have access to these cleaning products, then please do escalate. It's really, really important that we follow the procedures properly. And what I wanted to draw your attention to, obviously we don't always think about this, is box one at the bottom can't quite see all of my slide there, but it is on there for you later. It's just thinking about the different fluids. So it's not just your, your, um, your feces and blood. It's actually thinking about the other fluids that we may have um, exposure to as well to keep ourselves safe. So please, please just be mindful of that as well when you're looking after patients. And I put another link on there just to make things easy for you to the National Infection Prevention and Control Manual from NHS England. So that's probably just a whistle stop tour on equipment and the environment. I'm just going to quickly talk about the safe management of linen as well, which kind of falls into that criteria. So I've just kept a, a handy, a handy um, uh, visual there for you to think about the linen bags. One of the biggest bugbears I just wanted to share with you is if you're using the alginate bags, don't tie a knot in them because when they get put into the um, into the washing machines or lawn to be laundered. They don't always disintegrate as they're designed to do. There are specific tags that you need to use to make sure that they dissolve. And then all of the, um, the bedding that's within that, the linen that is washed appropriately at the right temperature. Otherwise, you risk um, that it doesn't undo appropriately and isn't washed. It's just something to really bear in mind when you're doing those. So making sure you use the right tags for those bags. So it might seem fairly straightforward, but it's really good revision for, uh, for all of us is don't shake linen, don't shake it. You're going to be spreading um, the infections that were in the, so to neatly kind of pull it away when you remove it from the bed trolleys, but equally so it doesn't touch the environment, so you're keeping it clean. Um, don't handle you use linen once it's bagged. It probably seems quite quite um, quite common practice, but it's something to consider. Do not overfill. I think we've all been, can be guilty of this. You know, you're on a busy night shift and you fill the bag up too high. Always make sure it's only two thirds full. That you spilt linen can be a, a, a real concern. Do not place inappropriate items in the laundry reciprocal, just checking. So if you're, you're changing a bed, there's nothing in a syringe or anything in the bed that you might wrap up as you're changing. 
Um, and it must be really make sure that we segregate laundry appropriately. It doesn't all get thrown into one bin. It's just thinking if it's been soiled, uh, you need to make sure it's in a water soluble bag, as I said, the alginate bag, as I said earlier, and just thinking about heat as well. And those, the colours may vary across trusts, but it's just those are an indicator of what you need to think about. So just as a bit of a recap on linen bags, make sure they're securely tied with the appropriate ties. Please don't overfill them and make sure they're tagged if you're within the hospital ward department a date if you need them returned as well. So just something to be mindful of and really important. Now, the next area we're going to cover, it does feel like a real whistle stop tour, is um, the safe management of waste as well. I'm just going to leave this. This is probably fairly um, common practice to all of you, but I wanted to draw attention to a couple of areas really just to think about, be more considered about your approach. And if you haven't got these bags within your ward or clinical area or wherever you work, your clinical setting, let's challenge estates or your procurement property services to make sure you've got access to these bins because it can have a real impact on the environment as well, the way we dispose of waste. So general waste, that's pretty common practice I'm not going to run there but what's really good is we're now seeing dry mixed recycling so if you haven't got that within your trust and organization I really would encourage you to perhaps take this say you've been to this webinar really encourage the change in practice if that's not common practice across your organization next area I wanted to kind of draw your attention to is that a lot of the time we use just yellow bags in practice when actually we can use orange infectious and offensive as well, tiger stripe as they're, they're affectionately known. And it's just thinking about your, your getting rid of things in the right bags because actually they're incinerated and disposed of in different ways. Can, a, can be costly, not financially, well, financially, but more importantly to the environment as well. So it's being really mindful about which bin you put these wastes in as well. And then finally, at the end is cytotoxic waste um, is disposed of in purple, purple bags. Um, so those of you that are working in oncology or those areas, obviously you will have those as common practice within your units um, or areas as well. So just being really mindful of that. And there is an exciting campaign um, at the moment, the tiger stripe bags. So I think it was called um, just making sure you use those appropriately because that's actually the least um, impactful on the environment using that one. So just being mindful about where you throw your rubbish away your waste away so next area on there is the safe management of blood and body spills as well so how do we keep you safe so um just looking at this this is just one of the um areas that's taken from the infection manual as well so it's thinking about again back to the, the personal ppe um, equipment that you wear um, making sure that you're wearing non step if you're wearing non-sterile disposable gloves etc but thinking about how you treat that so again it's making sure you've got spill kits available to you in close proximity so you can clean them quickly so if they're not available have a quick look at your next shift or when you're next on duty and have a look and make sure you've got access to those areas as well it's really really important for everyone's safety that we can clean up body spills uh, blood and body fluid spills very quickly and safely as well um, again, just a note at the bottom box one just covers all the different bodily fluids there for your information, but it's really important. It's escalated, the air is washed as well, and you perform hand hygiene. So for those areas there, but I'll let you read that in your own time, but share those with your teams. So moving um, on to the next slide is about sharp safety and occupational health. So all of us working with healthcare should have occupational health reviews, um, should have access to vaccinations to keep us safe at work. And it's making sure we keep up to date with that as well. And our organisation, but ourselves also have um, the responsibility to make sure this is in place. We need to keep ourselves and others and our patients safe. Um, so back to sharp safety, you know, we all have exposure um, to, sh um, to sharps, but it's thinking about this, there is um, a regulation act that came in 2013, uh, particularly in the safe use of sharps, but also looked at the use of an implementation of safety sharps within our environment. And it's really, really important that we adhere to those guidance to keep us safe, because as we know, the exposure to bloodborne viruses is quite serious and we need to really be responsive to work related sharps injuries. Um, and it is a significant occupational hazard for us. So it's really thinking really carefully. And there's some really important things that we need to adhere to to keep ourselves safe. And I'll talk about those in a moment. Um, on the right hand side is the checklist for if you are exposed, um, have an occupational exposure incident. So it's really important that you follow there. So the first thing you need to do is squeeze the area um, to make sure you squeeze the area um, of blood and run it under a, um, an irrigate and wash under a warm running tap with non-mo. 
do not suck. This probably seems fairly straightforward, but do not suck the wound or the, the, the exit site. Um, it's it's really important you don't damage um, suck the skin and actually contaminate yourself further. If there isn't running water immediately available, that, available then use sterile water or saline for irrigation. And what's really, and also it's the same instance as well for eyes and mouth, make sure you irrigate it appropriately as well. It's really, really important you report these incidences, even near misses as well have to be reported because we need to make sure people are safe and we've got the, the right precautions in, in place to um, support people. And it's also important we look at the, the potential severity of the incident as well, and then we can put corrective measures, making sure we have a really good learning culture so we can learn from these. So you might dismiss it, or it doesn't matter, it's, it was a clean, a clean needle, but actually it's really important that you report all of these as well. These are um, Sharps injuries. The other area to be really is that you do need to attend a &E or occupational health, but it depends on the investigation as well. But it's really important. This is escalated and this flow chart is adhered to because you need to keep yourself safe within the workplace. So just as a bit of a, a recap, really, a significant occupational exposure is a percutaneous injury. So injury from needles that penetrate the skin. Um, maybe from instruments as well, from bone fragments. So it's not just a issue from a needle. It might also be from a bite, which breaks the skin. Just be mindful of which environment you work in and you may be more exposed to those. Exposure to broken skin as well. So it might be abrasions, cuts, eczema, not traditional kind of um, needle stick or cut or surgical site as well. So it's just being really mindful of um, any open wounds. Um, exposure of mucous membranes to your eyes as well. So it's back to those eyes as well. If anything splashes in your eyes, that's an occupational exposure incident as well. And often we don't think about that, but it's really, really important. Um, so if you are going to have splashback or a splash, you always make sure you wear goggles back to that PPE as we were talking about earlier, um, just to keep ourselves safe. So more on sharps. So what do we need to do to keep ourselves safe? So as, where as, as as far as possible, if we can avoid using sharps, that's obviously the best, that's preventative, um, eliminating. But there are instances, obviously, where we need to use sharps. And in as many instances as possible, it's really important we use those safety devices that are in place to keep us safe. Now, not everywhere has them in place. I'm aware of that. And sometimes for certain procedures, you can't use them. But it's really, really important that you do use those in the first instance. Always follow the manufacturer's um, instructions for safe use and disposal may seem really obvious, but don't ever resheath the needle. I think that's one of the common parts. You put a needle on and then you actually miss and it goes through your finger or into your hand. And it's really, really important it's not recapped. Sharps must not be passed from hand to hand or certainly not to another individual. You've used the sharp, you dispose of it. And before you even start a procedure, make sure you've got sharps bin close to hand by your procedure trolley or wherever that might be on the wherever you're working. Perhaps in the community, you have that sharps bin right by you ready. So you're prepared. Best way for infection prevention guard to be prepared and make sure um, make sure everything's available for you to keep you safe. The other thing about is disposing of needles as one unit. You don't separate them out. They have to go as one unit into the sharp spin because, again, that, that puts you at unnecessary risk. Um, and again, I've talked about safety devices as well. For those working in the community or within residents, just making sure you've got sharps boxes that have temporary closures as well. So not rattling around or emptying them out if you're going from um, place to place. And just on the right hand side, um, another lovely flow chart here is about the different types of lidded boxes, as um, lidded sharps bins that are available. So on the left hand side is purple lidded, which is um, cytotoxic waste, um, making sure these sharps go into those purple because they're disposed of differently. And then obviously with contaminated, if they're contaminated medicines, no, they go into the orange lidded or if they are the yellow lidded, just so they're disposed of in the appropriate way uh, because of the toxins from medicines, etc. So I hope that was helpful. So I'm just checking on time. Oh, good. I'm on to time. So that's good. So we've got time for questions at the end. It really was a whistle stop tool. And there is so much more information for you to read. But I guess my main takeaways for you today is Infection prevention control is everyone's responsibility to keep ourselves safe, to keep our patients, our residents, our clients safe, and also the wider population as well. If we can break that chain of transmission of infection, break that chain of infection, and we can do that by simple measures that we've gone through, um, washing our hands, wearing PPE, disposing of waste in the appropriate way, keeping the environment and equipment safe, disposing of linen in the right way, 
all of these things, you know, standard fundamentals of IPC, we can all practice daily and make sure we do them in the right way. It will keep us all safe. Use this pack. Please take it away. Share it far and wide. Make sure you access the links as well to educate yourself if you want to read more on the topics. But making sure you use these appendices and all of the, the diagrams and, and flowcharts I've shared with you today to ensure that we're spreading best, best practice right across um, our healthcare settings. And read the manual. It's 69 pages. I don't think that's too bad for a manual, but it's 69 pages. And there's more for the, for the research um, minded amongst you. There's some really great lit reviews which demonstrate the evidence that backs up all the standard precautions that are in there. You can read further, but it's a really, really great resource. Um, and I want to say a special thank you to Sue Millwood and Lisa Ritchie and the IPC lead team who have um, supported me with this presentation. So it wouldn't be a miss of me, uh, a miss of me not to mention that. So thank you to, to Sue and Lisa. Um, here's my contact details if you want to keep in contact or learn more. And I wanted to leave you with one quote. I started with a quote, so I thought I'd, I'd leave you with another one. Is education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. So we educate ourselves and educate others, we can change. Um, the outcomes of our patients and improve um, improve their morbidity and mortality as well. So I guess let's work together on this webinar and on the other webinars that the nursing times are providing to make sure we're providing best practice and the clinical skills for the environment. And last but not least, before I hand back to Steve for some questions, is um, it would be amiss of me not to mention our IPC programme, which we at the FNF, uh, Florence Nightingale Foundation, um, developed, co-developed and designed in partnership with Lisa Ritchie, um, the NHS England team. It's an online programme and it's designed to equip you with the skills, a bit more in depth, of a lot more in depth of what we've gone through today, um, a module on um, IPC, but also about empowering you to challenge poor practice, what you can do as an individual to challenge and nudge and have the authority to perhaps more senior clinicians or across the clinical team to make sure we have good practice for all of us because to be IPC champions is a really, really important part for all of us to play. Um, if you don't believe me, it's a good course. There's a couple of quotes there and there's a 98% satisfaction rate as well. And it really helped um, nurses, midwives, healthcare support works from across our um, clinical settings to feel empowered to, um, to champion IPC, but also to raise their voice and make sure our patients are safe because it's really important that we will advocate for safe practice for our patients. So that's it from me. I think I've met the brief, Steve. So over to you for some questions, if that's OK. And the Great. Timing. Great. Thank, Thank you very much, Lucy. Yep, absolutely spot on with the timing. Um, so I'm sure everyone watching will agree that was an absolutely brilliant presentation on the fundamentals of IPC. Um, Obviously, Lucy, you described it as a whistle-stop tour, but I think we covered uh, an awful lot of ground uh, in, in that presentation, which was absolutely fabulous. Um, and I'll certainly be, um, be be more aware of commodes next time I encounter one. Um, so, as you said, it's now time for the Q and A section. Uh, I think we've got around fifteen minutes or so. We can possibly do a bit more if more come in. Um, I'm pleased to say we've already had. Uh, a few in already um, and I've got a few up my sleeve as well um, but yes just keep okay, dropping thanks. them into the chat um, so uh, where should we start we'll start with the first question as that's only fair so Rachel Shaw um, so Rachel um, says she wants to ask about normal nail polish so she says she is currently updating IPC protocols in her practice and wanted to double check no, so no, no nail polish at all. So I, I guess I'm not very in favour with it all, but no nail polish at all in the environment. No acrylics. I think that's the fancy new stuff. And um, well, there's nothing on it. It's a really good reservoir for bacteria, which we want to avoid. So sorry, no nail varnish at work, I'm afraid, in clinical practice. And uh, um, from Amanda Garn, I think I pronounced that right. Um, it says gloves. I was going to ask about gloves again, but um, I suspect I know the answer. But Amanda wants to know when administering medication, is it necessary to wear gloves? Depends which medication it is, um, but if and how you're ex exposing it. So if you're um, and there is some evidence to show that actually we we feel like we're protected when we're not. So obviously, if you're um, giving um, so it's antibiotics and obviously on oncology drugs as well. If you're exposing them, you need to be careful. You don't absorb it through your skin. But most medication, you don't actually need to wear gloves. You need to make sure you use a non-touch technique, which is quite a new thinking, isn't it? And actually perhaps makes some of us feel quite nervous. I'll share some evidence for you as well, because it's always good to have evidence to back up what we say. 
Great. And another topic that seems to have been uh, that's uh, been quite uh, of interest is is iron ashes. I, I think this is basically false iron ashes. Um, oh, wow. Than, okay. ones. But I had a couple of questions in on that. Um, so uh, Joanne Joanne Assad Assad um, has asked. Uh, do, do eyelashes have anything to do with infection control? Um, and then Raquel uh, Villanueva has uh, has added on to that and says, um, so this is more or more taking um, sorry taking action. Um, says I can see many practitioners, uh, e.g., nurses, HCAs, technicians, doctors wearing false eyelashes. Um, this is currently not yet in our uh, our policy, IPC policy. Um, how can I challenge staff about this? I, I suppose that also should you challenge staff about this as well? Well, do you know what? You've that. stumped me there because I don't know because you're not actually physically touching patients with your eyelashes. That might sound fairly obvious, but I don't see that would be a risk as such. It might be an effect, a, a risk to yourselves if you're using kind of, um, but I, let me come back to you on that because I don't want to take the wrong research, but I would say I, I, as the best of my knowledge, I don't know if you can or cannot wear let me come back to you, Steve. I don't want to yes, say the wrong yeah. thing. Is there a danger of them dropping dropping off? I don't know. Yeah, well, protecting yeah. in theatre as well. So you try and avoid anything like that that's stuck, stuck on, but because you don't want that to be going into any operating site, but you would be wearing goggles and, and glove sites as well. Let me just look that up because I don't want to tell you the wrong information. Great, thank you. And moving on to uh, Deborah Ford. And um, she says, Great update. Um, as this is a fundamental subject, why is it not included in NMC revalidation requirements? Oh, that sounds like a, a good query we need to take to Andrea Sutcliffe, I think. So, um, I think so. good point, yeah. really good point. Um, yeah, it should be on mandatory standards. So, yeah, that's something for us to take forward. Mm. Great. Good point. Yeah, Stephen, um, I can pick that up separately. <laughs> yeah, of... yeah. Well, I, yes, there's a chance I might see Andrea next week, so maybe I'll try and put that in my back pocket for for when I see her. Yeah. Mm. Um, so Leslie Connor. Um, so Leslie says um, she educates staff to execute the specific order steps of hand hygiene. Um, yep. IPC say the order isn't the priority as long as steps are completed, which is correct. I've searched for a reference to the benefit of correct order. Is there one, please? I know that might be one to come back to. Um, one that we've I, had a look. Um, I don't know. You should you should follow the the steps and you repeat the steps. So that might be where the confusion is lied. It's quite clear in that um, the post that I've shared. So perhaps take that back to your teams or, or the individual you're mentioning and just share that with them because it's really important you do follow the steps one to eight. Because it would be. Depends which order you mean, but if you're wet, not drying your hands appropriately at the end, that wouldn't be following the process. So I think it's really important for standard practice, you all follow the same process. And that's very clear in um in the um in the diagram, the, the flow chart that I've showed you earlier. So perhaps take that back as a resource and educate one another on that would be my advice. Great, thank you. And Dawn Sutton, so this is about the uh, the IPC champion course. Um, basically, um, can health and social care staff access it? I suppose the question is, how do you access it? How do you get on it? Yes, so um, so it can be commissioned, places can be commissioned by your organisation. So if you're really keen to get involved, um, please do get in contact and I can contact your organisation to see if they'd like to um, get some places on the programme. So um, drop me an email, if you've got my details in the link. And I can um, speak to your um, organisation, see what we can do to help you. Great. Uh, again, we're, we're back to back to the nail polish this time. <laughs> so, Ella uh, Farmer, who may be sorry, um, sorry, uh, sorry very much about your name. Um, is is nail polish restricted for managers working in clinical areas, but not engaging with patient facing duties? Um, so I guess so this yeah. is a bit of a tricky one and I remember having a bit of a discussion when I was dipsy looking after GPs as well you sh it's best practice isn't it to role model as leaders of, of your staff so personally I wouldn't wear um, nail varnish but if you're not patient facing and patient go up a patient contact then you could technically wear your nails but personally I would advocate that you are role modeling and advocating in the right way with your teams um, to set the standards Great. So we've had tons of questions in, so it's, it's, uh, they're coming in thick and fast. Um, just going to take a quick pause and ask a couple of my own, if that's all right. Okay. Um, 
So I just wanted to, I so I've got a couple, but um, I suppose it seems like a no brainer um, what you said um, in terms of patient safety and financial factors. Um, but is, 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 you know, is uh, IPC, do you think, is it, is it being taken seriously enough um, or, or is it sometimes seen as just a sort of some annoying rules um, that, that people have to follow? It's um it's interesting because I I was a, a director of infection Dipsy I've said Dipsy it's easier to say um before and through the pandemic and I think people were never particularly interested people used to, when you do your audits they weren't they weren't always keen to engage with it but I think everyone has become it's become really apparent how important it is for the pandemic and people are, seem to be more compliant it's an absolute mandatory component of our practice and you can keep everybody safe look at the statistics I shared with you earlier that speaks for themselves so it's it's something we all should get involved in nudge each other encourage each other because it's one of the simplest ways we can keep our patients safe and it's it, through really simple measures as well absolutely um so but uh, I guess my ask is take it seriously spread the word and let's nudge each other to have good behaviors in place well, that, that's partly why we're here, isn't it? So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so... <laughs> um, and you mentioned um, bare below the elbow. And obviously that, that's a phrase that's very much ingrained in the UK um, and almost goes without saying, I, I, I would think. Um, but I must admit, so when you, when, you, um, when you look at pictures um, of, healthcare, of healthcare settings globally, um, TV, things like that, you know, it's, it's not that uncommon um, from what I've seen to see um, see sleeves, you know, doctors in white coats and things like that. I mean, why is that? Is there a, is there a, is it a lack of global consensus or is it just, uh, just am I looking at the wrong, wrong pictures and things? Well, I don't know. It does. It's a good question. I think it might be lack of understanding and, and, you know, behaviours that are in place and lack of education. So perhaps Steve, we can run these globally to educate people. But if you imagine you've got the, the cuffs are going to be going, if you're doing procedures, they're going to be rubbing on the patient in wounds and you're spreading that from patient to patient. And there was a study years ago, God, I'm showing my age, but some years ago about ties, ties dangling from patient. They couldn't understand how infections were being spread by, around wards from bay to bay because the doctor was going from bed to bed with their tie dangling from patient to patient as they leant over to examine. So it's, it's yes, you probably the, the, perhaps the, the photos you're seeing are outdated or perhaps there's mm, a need for education mm, more mm. broadly. Um, and as we, as we saw from the figures from WHO, from World Health Organization, there's higher prevalence in of um, hospital acquired infections in low and middle in, in, income countries. So perhaps there's a real need to support and target there as well. I see. I think if you want to wear a bow, uh, a tie, wear a bow tie, maybe. But yeah. Hey, oh, that's um, great um, advice. Uh, <laughs> I should have put that in the presentation. Well, yeah, just, just, you know, <laughs> and it's more one, fun. One, one, yeah, it was one particular GP who was quite, quite a, quite a senior GP. Or I remember we used to wear a bow tie, um, and that was the reason infection prevention. Anyway, uh, right. Um, so um, you mentioned um, um, single use and multi use equipment, um, and of course sustainability um, hugely important. Um, yeah. Have we? got that right essentially are, are we using too much single use uh in terms of sustainability this. reasons or but or is it key you know for ipc in in a health healthcare setting do we need to stick to it um it's a know. really really good question i could i could give you the long answer but we might be here long beyond four o'clock but the short answer is we need to change the way we practice. And I, I gave you a bit of a, and I'm happy to come back and share about sustainability perhaps another time, but single use plastic, we've become so reliant on having me throwing them away. We used to autoclave everything in back not so long ago and reuse equipment, particularly surgical equipment as well. So we are, there is a shift back. Obviously we've got to be mindful of contamination, infecting patients, but there's a lot we can do in this space. A lot we can do to tackle and question and ask why, why we're doing things. Um, but I think for the moment, obviously, we need to keep patients safe for single use plastics, but there's lots coming in. And obviously, processes and procedures will be changing as we look at more sustainable ways and actually learn from um, from countries from a lower and middle income where they have they've always used the autoclaves and not had the single use plastics. There's lots that we can learn together globally to make sure we've got more sustainable practices because we do use a lot of single use plastics, let's be honest. Um, and the other thing to think about, just something else to, if, you're, if I'm stimulating any thought in your brain, is thinking about you can use patient, um, the patient, so you can use a single use plastics potentially multiple times for one patient because you're not contaminating in that way. So something to think about, and I guess maybe my plea to all of you, 
go back to your practice it practice and think about asking why because you could always tackle the manufacturers and think about why are we using single use uh, try and create a movement steve hey so where, where are we looking just, yeah. start thinking more considerately about what we do um in the healthcare environment rather than just mindlessly throwing things in the bin absolutely great advice uh, yeah if you, if you ask questions and um you know that that's that's how change starts i think especially if, uh, if it's enough people asking the same question uh yeah um so we've had uh, a couple more in from uh from the audience they're quite practical ones uh so ross mckinnon uh ross wants to know so empty used uh blister packs for tablets is the question is about um okay. should these be disposed of in normal domestic waste black bags or are they considered uh, medicinal waste so that's a really good question it would be disposable um in my opinion it would be the disposable domestic waste unless obviously it's been contaminated if you're in a um perhaps as a patient has been isolated and been in contact with a patient that's just something to consider i hope that's helpful perfect and on to ranjit uh, verdi who asks how often do you recommend ic uh, audits should be done on the ward or clinical areas Oh, good question. Um, so, well, as regularly as possible, I think it's always important to um, nudge colleagues as well. Um, but it, it should be done on a monthly basis. You should, most places, I don't want to, I don't want to mandate it, but most places should have an IPC link um, lead, and that's a really good role. And to do them at least, at least monthly is an absolute minimum would be, but weekly would be desirable. And looking at all different shifts as well, that's what's really important, not just doing the same time every week, but actually looking at if you're doing it on night shift, different shifts, different areas, just to make sure that you're really getting a true representation of what's happening within your unit. And, and um, <laughs> you find it's the Monroe effect, isn't it? If you're being audited, people are either um, either are really good at practice or perhaps not as good at practice. So it's really important that perhaps you can... Um, uh perhaps do it while you're working as well so you can do it in practice and nudge people to do the right thing um but it's really important for surveillance as well to make sure people are uh, acting in a safe way great and and this is a, a return to our discussion um from just a minute ago on sustainability um joanne bellaby uh, asks what are your thoughts on tourniquets uh, we advocate single use but that's a lot of plastic so I've so this is exciting. So um probably probably sensing that I'm I'm keen on sustainability. So we've actually got a project that's being launched as part of our green leadership program, which is looking exactly this, the single use tourniquets and looking using it as um so at the moment we do use single use, but you can actually wipe them over. So there is a manufacturer that's making wipeable tourniquets, which is a really great addition, not the fabric ones, but also using tourniquets per patient. So back to what I said earlier. So I think there's a study that we're just about to launch to watch this space, and I'll make sure I'll share that with all of you, um, looking at multiple use tourniquets, but particularly around one per patient for maternity services as well. So just, again, back to that mindful, considerate approach. You know, do we need to throw this in the bin? But a really good question. Uh, really, really good question. I guess I urge you all to think in that way. Start questioning the why, because that's the basis of evidence-based practice, isn't it? And I, I suppose in, in terms of advice for people um, and our audience in general, um, how do you think we best get the required changes in? So it could be IPC best practice or it could be sustainability around that. Is it, is it, is it small changes, little steps, or is it big ones? Uh, you know, how, how do you, how do you, how do you get, uh, how do you change hearts and minds? <laughs> yeah, good point, actually, Steve. So there's so small changes, small incremental changes will change human behavior and practices. Um, and you do small incremental changes, you can you can rapidly scale them up to have a bigger impact. But also things like, so I think we, we spoke earlier, Steve, didn't we, about transformational change. If there's an emergency like the pandemic, you can have big change quickly because of emergency situations as well, like the pandemic, you know, going to virtual wards and telehealth, things like that. So, so both would be my answer. But I guess for all of you on the call, small increment changes, little nudges to, to, to colleagues, you know, subtle things like passing a pair of gloves or, oh, did you forget to do this? That is a nice way of doing it. You don't have to be too harsh on people, but find your voice and challenge one another because together you you can change practice and improve standards and raise standards. Student nurses are brilliant at doing that as well. So you've got student nurses, they come out fresh from university, full of all the all good ideas and, and always listen to those. It's always good to have student nurses on your on your units as well. 
Yeah, p- perfect, perfect segue say. there. In fact, yeah, I meet, I meet um, quite a few students on my on my travels, um, and yeah, the Student Nursing Times Awards, which are open for entries at the moment, we've uh, we've actually got a, a new category on sustainability in there. Um, brilliant. You know, in recognition of, of how brilliant um, students are, at, as, as as you say, uh, um, you know, championing uh, championing new things and, and ideas, and, and then uh, helping spread that. So yeah, brilliant. Um, right. Oh, let me look. Have we got? Um, I was just about to say we're nearly out of time, but uh, we've got another okay, question, have we? That's helpful. Well, yeah, you, you've, you've done amazingly, so let's have a look. Um, I need to get match on the eyelashes, though. That was a good <laughs> question. You stumped me on that one. <laughs> so, uh, Ra- Rachel Shaw. So, Rachel uh, was, so she's replying to the tourniquets question. She says, I work in general practice and we can take 20 plus blood tests a day. So it always seems like a huge waste. So that, that's basically a, a comment um, just to share with everyone on the tourniquets question. Um, so, yeah, as I said, we, we've... We're well, I can share, I'll share the manufacturer details for the yeah. white ones because I think that would be really helpful and how good if we could get that into practice areas. Yeah, That'd be that so would good. Be great. That would be brilliant if we can, yeah, if we can change, change something on the back of this webinar. That would be fantastic. Uh, right. Um, obviously, you already um, mentioned your, your take home messages earlier with the slide. But yeah, basically, um, if you if you want to, if you want to, uh, again, try and uh, try and distill what you want people to remember from from this afternoon into one or one or two things or three, if you like, um, okay. you know, the resource to take back, what, what would it what would it be? I said, well, you're all here, you've come because you clearly want to learn and educate. So actually, I guess your role is to take that back into practice and encourage your colleagues to do the same. And through education, you know, we can achieve great things and change and keep our patients safe. Um, read, keep up to date. And I guess it's all of our responsibility. So don't assume that somebody else is doing it all play your part in infection prevention and control to keep our patients safe wherever you work, which other health getting that healthcare setting that is. Um, and give people a gentle nudge. That's the perfect place to end, I think. So that's it. I'm afraid we have run out of time for today. Um, thank you again to Lucy for her brilliant presentation uh, and thank obviously you. her time as well. Uh, and thank you, audience, for taking part and for asking loads of questions and some really, really good ones as well. So thank you very much. Um, please do share um, what you've heard and seen this afternoon. Uh, I hope it was useful. Um, and I also hope to see you at one of our other clinical skills or digital nursing webinars in the near future still to come this year we've got a webinar on sepsis on the 28th of november and one on medicines management on the 6th of december and even sooner than that we've got a digital innovation webinar on the 1st of november which is all about virtual wards and remote monitoring um, so i hope you can join me for for that one or one of the others or all of them in fact so they're all free um, so more details can be found about any of these webinars and how to register for them on the Nursing Times website. But for now, I hope you've had a really, uh, I hope you have a really good uh, rest of the day. Goodbye.